Welcome everyone to our next episode of AI Horizons. These are particular uh, talks that we have uh, gathered from our AI and Future of Work conference that we had on the Philadelphia campus in May of 2024. Um, this conference had hundreds of industry and academics that presented and we are delighted to have three of those academics with us today to talk about AI and human collaboration. This is, like I said, one of the episodes of several that we have in the works. Uh, feel free to uh, check back with us on these other topics that we have. My name is Mary Perk. I'm the Executive Director of AI at Wharton and my guest Panelists today are Anil Doshi, the Assistant Professor of UCL School of Management in London, Alex Morin, the Assistant Professor of, at Purdue University at the Daniel School of Business, and Nick Pankus, PhD student at our very own Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. So our first speaker is Anil, and Anil will be speaking about experimental evidence on the and within person effects of using generative AI intelligence. So Anil, please okay. take it away. Thanks, Mary, thanks so much. As I am getting my slides set up here, um, I just wanted to say thank you for explicitly saying that it's UCL in London. I think oftentimes people hear UCL and then they add an A and think I'm in Los Angeles. So I'm on the opposite side of the, of the ocean uh, here in London uh, at UCL. and I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, research that I conducted uh, with one of our doctoral students, Jing Zawang, and Blaine Landis, a colleague of mine uh, here at UCL. And just a little bit, the genesis of this, the genesis of this project was essentially to understand uh, how generative AI affects the individual worker's perspective of their own work. And so, you know, this is yes, we're having the we're having the workers work with AI. We're going to have them interact with AI and do all the things that we think about with generative AI. But we're focused in in this research on if you're using generative AI, how does it affect the individual workers' attitude about their work, their their perceptions in the workplace, their their the the work that they undertake, and, and kind of like their attitudes and behaviors about their own work. So we can think of kind of. Uh, three perspectives we might take on this. That's all, you know, there's a lot of debate in, in the press right now and in, in, in academia, but what, what the effect of, of generative AI is going to be. So on the one hand, you can say, well, there are these feedback effects. So uh, new ways of getting work done uh, lead to more productivity that then lead to kind of like different ways of thinking about how, uh, uh, different ways of how workers might think of their own work. Uh, you can think of a second perspective saying, well, generative AI makes my do have to do kind of less at work because it automates some stuff for me. So since I'm doing less of the effort, maybe I attribute less of the meaning at work, or maybe I have more free time that I can allocate to more meaningful uh, work activities. So we can think of that as being, uh, you know, one or the other. It's it's kind of like uh, uh, um, uh, 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 kind of like a horse race uh, here. We don't know which which way it's going to go. And in the third perspective, we can say, well, you know, generative AI is causing a lot of concern. First of all, using the tool might lead to hallucinations. Then there's this kind of existential threat about automation. I'm worried about my work. So we have these three kinds of lines of reasoning that we want to explore and investigate in our study. And so what we do is we run an experiment with actual workers in the workplace. So this is not in a lab. This is not with uh, undergraduate students. Uh, we use we, we, you know, we recruit workers that are working in their everyday jobs. Uh, the average age of a person is uh, about 30 years old. They have six and a half years of experience. And they have job titles like any, you know, job titles across industries. So there's a, a pretty generalizable study, we think, you know, software developers, uh, program administrators, uh, directors, and things like that. And what we do is uh, every morning over a five-day period, we ask them to either randomly ask them to either use generative AI as much as possible during the day or to avoid it as much as possible today, during the day or not use it at all. And essentially what we're doing is we're going to collect a lot of data at the end of every day and compare the days where workers use generative AI against the days where they did not use generative AI against a, a bunch of outcomes. So I'm gonna summarize those outcomes. There's a whole menu of things that we looked into. Uh, I'll try and hit the highlights. And if there are any questions, I can I can delve into the results a little bit later. Although I make a note to try not to say the word delve because that's kind of a sim symptomatic of, of you're using generative AI. So I it, I promise you, this is me. This is not a, a video rendering of me. Uh, okay, so 
Uh, with respect to the feedback effects, what do we find? So first of all, uh, we find that employees take on more task crafting. Uh, so what is task crafting? That means I'm doing more work. I'm doing more work in different kinds of ways. I'm expanding the scope of the work I want to take on. Uh, so we, we were pretty, this was a pretty exciting result for us because it suggested to us that generative AI is opening up the scope of the work that the employees take on uh, rather than kind of like narrowing it or make them kind of, you know, uh, comparatively uh, have a comparative advantage in a certain task and specializing in it. So we, we, were, we were pretty excited to see that. We also find that they, they perceive to have more progress in their work day and they feel more challenged by their work. So you could think maybe generative AI might make things simpler or kind of like reduce your workload by automating, but they actually took on more challenge. They felt more challenge in, in the workplace. Um, with respect to meaning, we don't find any evidence that they change their meaning, the, the perceived meaning of the work. But we do find that there is this positive relationship with uh, how much perceived appreciation their peers have of them. So it's what they think their peers are thinking of them, but they do think they have more job demands. So that is kind of the, the one downside of that result. We did find that that result was disproportionately uh, related to um, people who had less experience. And so people with more experience didn't quite feel that job demands thing. And we have some you know, reasons why we think that might be the case. And then finally, uh, if anything, instead of having uh, more concerns and more worries, we find that people have uh, uh, some fewer concerns and worries. So, um, so that that's uh, that that we didn't find a lot in this attitudes bucket, though. So we kind of are thinking about these first set, first two columns as the as the main set of results in the in the study. So just kind of summarizing, uh, employees have new days, new ways of doing work. Uh, they they feel more valued from their colleagues, but they feel like their work feels more demanding. Um, no signs of insecurity. You know, maybe uh, maybe there's a little, maybe there's too little insecurity. Maybe we need them to be a little bit more worried about uh, uh, working with generative AI. But essentially, what we find here is a very optimistic story with generative AI use, where people use generative AI and they establish a, a new connection to work. And we're pretty excited about this research. We think it has a, a lot of value. Uh, human resources departments uh, uh, across industries might be uh, interested in this work. Thanks very much, Mary. It's incredibly exciting. And um, just as a follow up question, as um, do you think this is good? I know we're kind of at these beginning stages of really absorbing AI in the workplace. So this, the, the, you know, hopefully you'll be able to keep tracking this. Um, so that was one question if you'll, you'll continue to track it. But given that they, uh, you mentioned they didn't have as much anxiety as maybe you thought they should have. Um, is that possibly really good in the beginning? So people, once they hear about that or they experience it, they'll be even that much more open to learning. And we might even see more productivity or more, um, I think you called it task crafting, you know, these other this other term they introduced. So I was wondering if you could just comment on, are you going to be able to keep tracking this? Um, is it going forward? Sure. And then on to that other question. Yeah, so those are those are great questions. I, I, so as part of this specific study, uh, we're not going to track those same workers, um, but we are definitely uh, uh, structuring a follow on study. Uh, we're, we're exploring opportunities with with, uh, you know, industry partners. Uh, so if there's any firms out there that want to work with us on this project, please, please reach out. That would be fantastic. Um, so we, we are going to uh, extend the research uh, over time uh, uh, with different versions of the study. That's the first point uh, to that specific question. Uh, and to your second question about kind of, uh, is, it, is it a positive thing that they don't feel anxiety? I mean, look, I, I, we've all used it. And I think we've all had this mix of um, excitement and wonder and amazement by what it's producing, but then this little kind of like pit of concern uh, uh, behind it. So maybe we didn't quite capture that in the way we were asking these questions, but I think these things work hand in hand. But we were overall... Uh, uh, pleasantly surprised to see that there was this kind of embrace of the technology, or, or, or more specifically, an embrace of their work using the new technology, which I think is a, a, a more relevant measure when we're thinking about uh, the workers in the workplace themselves. Yeah, and I'll just close out and we'll move over to Alex, is that, you know, I, I can't imagine as a researcher how exciting this is because it's like this perfect experiment where people haven't used a technology, and so you're testing it for the first time. It actually, you know, kind of going forward, it will be a little bit more difficult. It's just like when you're interviewing people for a trial 
and they've all heard about the case and they're kind of excluded from that perfect you know, control test group. And so there will have to be some <laughs> nuances in that. Um, so I, I, it's getting, your job is gonna get a bit harder, I think. Well, well said, Barry. So we, when we run experiments, we like to say we have a treatment and we have a control and the right. control is the status quo. I think in future experiments, it's gonna kind of flip, right? The control is going to be everyone's using generative AI and the treatment is, hey, st stop using for a minute. Let's see how you feel about it. But then the effects might be interpreted differently. So it's a it's a it's a nuance, but it's it's an important point. Uh, uh, that's a that's a good way to end that conversation, I think. Great, thank you so much. Next, um, we have Al. Uh, yes, we have Alex. Alex Morin from um, Purdue, and Alex uh, will be talking to us uh, about um, the expertise in AI and um, how it relates to uh, radiology, which a lot of us um, know that's been very, very important in terms of supervised machine learning and what it has come to pass. So looking forward to hearing what you have in your results and your research here, Alex. Take it away. Well, thank you so much, Mary and Carol, for put, putting on this series. Uh, I just want to confirm my slides are showing okay. Um, but as uh, was mentioned, I'm Alex Mooring. I'm an assistant professor at the Daniel School of Business at Purdue. Uh, this is a project I work on with some colleagues at MIT, Nikhil Agarwal and Tavia Sals, uh, and Pranav Rajprakar, who's at Harvard Medical School. So this project is called Combining Human Expertise with AI, Experimental Evidence from Radiology. Uh, and Okay, great. Uh, the motivation for this project was pretty simple. You know, we noticed that AI is a transformative technology. It's general purpose, impacting many different uh, different industries and types of jobs. And one thing that's sort of unique about AI relative to previous technologies is that it's been particularly influential at uh, impacting and augmenting tasks that have traditionally been done by uh, more high skilled labor. And so, radiology is an iconic example of this. Uh, radiology or artificial intelligence, excuse me, has made uh, vast inroads uh, at doing tasks traditionally done by human radiologists. Uh, so this quote by Curtis Langlox, I think is quite reflective of this. Uh, when asked if uh, he thinks uh, artificial intelligence will replace human radiologists, he says, you know, the right answer is actually radiologists who use AI will replace radiologists who don't. And so this motivated us to study a human AI collaboration in radiology. So specifically, we're going to ask three related research questions. We're first going to ask how does the private information that's available to human radiologists influence the accuracy of their decisions. And we'll contrast this with how uh, the availability of a new AI tool uh, impacts the accuracy of their decisions. So to measure this, we'll conduct an information exper experiment with practicing radiologists, and we'll ask them to read uh, actual chest X-rays. Uh, second, we'll try and unpack the decisions made by humans. And in particular, we'll try and understand what biases humans exhibit uh, when incorporating the AI signal or the AI information with their own sort of private information. And we'll try and measure specific biases uh, that humans exhibit when updating their beliefs uh, in response to the AI signal. And we'll compare them to what an optimal decision maker or a Bayesian uh, would make. Finally, we'll try and understand what implications these biases have for the design of optimal human AI collaboration, we'll solve what we call an optimal delegation policy, where we try and think about in what situations would you want a case to be read by a human alone, a human with access to AI, or to just fully automate a case. So here's sort of a quick overview of the experiment. We developed a platform where radiologists uh, log in uh, remotely, and they assess uh, many different chest x-rays. We designed it to the extent possible to mimic sort of true clinical practice. Uh, but what we'll end up observing is going to be the uh, probability assessment uh, for each case of the likelihood of um, about 100 chest pathologies, um, the probability that uh, the radiologist assesses that, that that pathology is present, okay? We'll randomize a couple things in this experiment. First, we're going to randomize whether or not humans have access to an AI algorithm. This is going to be a convolutional neural net. It's uh, the Chexpert algorithm. Uh, it's sh been shown to be quite good in many circumstances, uh, including relative to the radiologists participating in our experiment. Uh, so that'll be one dimension of randomization, whether or not they have access to this, uh, to the predictions from this Chexpert algorithm. The second dimension is going to be whether or not the human has access to the patient's clinical history. So this includes private information that's typically available to a radiologist, but not currently included in um, uh, radiology AI algorithms. 
And so this information will include uh, patient's clinical history, uh, vital information, uh, demographics, labs, uh, et cetera. So we randomize whether or not radiologists have access to these different pieces of information. And these are sort of the key findings from the experiment. So first we find that this private information that's available to radiologists is quite impactful. So it improves the accuracy of human assessment, assessments. However, on average, having access to the AI tool does not improve the accuracy of human assessments. And this is not because humans are just ignoring the AI tool, rather it's because there's a sort of interesting pattern of heterogeneous effects, depending on how confident the AI is. So if the AI is very confident that a pathology is not present or that a pathology is present, it tends to improve the accuracy of human decisions. So humans do better when they have access to the AI uh, and they receive a confident signal. However, if they receive a sort of uncertain or middling AI signal, humans actually do worse and make less accurate decisions when they have access to the AI relative to when they don't. So this immediately rejects Bayesian updating. If we're sort of optimally incorporating this information, we should never do worse when we have access to more information. So next in the paper, we try and unpack what explains this pattern. And in particular, we try and estimate or find evidence of biases that humans are exhibiting uh, when they're incorporating the AI information in their own uh, decisions. And we find evidence of two biases. First is what we call automation neglect. This is where humans under respond to uh, AI information. So they're not updating enough in response to a, uh, an AI signal. And second is what we call signal dependence neglect. So humans act as if their own information is independent of the AI signal conditional on the true state of the world. Okay, so this is not the case. Both the AI and the human are looking at the same X-ray image. So even conditional on this true state of the world, there's some residual correlation uh, between their signals. So humans are doing a little bit of double counting here. So importantly, the, the model that we find most consistent with the data replicates this pattern of heterogeneous treatment effects, where if the human gets a, a confident AI signal, their uh, assessments become more accurate. If humans uh, get an uncertain AI signal, their assessments become less accurate. The last thing we do is solve what we call an optimal delegation problem, where we try and, uh, as a function of the AI signal, decide whether a case should be read by a human alone, a human with access to AI, or fully automate the case. Uh, we do this both for uh, Bayesian humans or humans who are optimally combining their own information with that of the AI, as well as the actual humans of their data or in our data. And we contrast the solution uh, for these two different types of, of humans. Uh, on the left, we plot the solution for various costs of misdiagnoses on the x-axis. And what we see is that, you know, if the cost of a misdiagnosis is sufficiently large, we want to involve the human in the decision-making process, but we almost always involve the human with access to AI because they're optimally combining these two pieces of information. This looks very different when we look at the humans in our experiment, where again, as the cost of a misdiagnosis increases, we want to involve the human, but we almost always involve the human without access to an AI because of the biases they exhibit. So to wrap up, you know, the objective here was to try and understand uh, human AI collaboration in a radiology setting. Our main findings are on average, AI does not improve um, the accuracy of human assessments. And this is a result of these two biases uh, that I discussed. Uh, the upshot for the, um, the impact of these biases on the design of human AI collaboration is that we will often see humans working alongside AI rather than collaborating uh, directly with uh, an AI assistant because of these biases. And now I think this has a lot of implications for both training humans, but also how we could think about designing AI tools to be, um, or to maximize the performance of these teams. I'd be happy to talk more about that in the, the discussion, but thank you again for, for having me. Thank you, Alex. I'm just going to pose one question to you uh, right now and before we go to our next um, speaker. So it's so interesting how you um, divided this this experiment because you previously, or at least what I mean, what I've read and I have a friend who is actually a, a radiologist. Um, the way they had been looking at it was, you know, AI would kind of discern some of these you know, definitely these cases that they just would not have to see. And then they would be getting the cases that they definitely should be reviewing. So there was some, what they were getting, it was that kind of this false belief that everything that the AI did was fairly accurate. And so maybe this is, I don't know if 
again, to the point where we made that we said with Anil, I mean, many of these radiologists have been working with supervised machine learning for some time now and know the strength of what these models can do. So it's, you know, hard, to, it's hard to separate their bias. It's, a, it's almost like in, innate in them at this point. So I think your, um, your, your research has um, big implications. Um, are you suggesting in this that uh, when radiologists are looking at cases that they should be informed? I mean, should, should there be, that from the American Medical Association, should they be putting in cases that potentially the AI hadn't been looking at so that they just kind of know it's always a test? I don't, I'm just kind of curious, how do, we, how do we help doctors not fall into this bias? Or have you thought about that? Yeah, I've thought a lot about it. I, I mean, to be honest, I think it's a really hard problem for humans to overcome. And I suspect it applies more generally, not just with sort of highly trained radiologists. To uh, correctly update your beliefs in response to this AI information, you have to really understand the, the correlation between the AI signal and your own information, which for even people like us who think a lot about these things would be quite hard to do uh, and just sort of, you know, learn this correlation from our own experience. So I think a perhaps more promising route is to actually design the tools to match the assumptions that humans are placing on them. So if humans are um, treating the AI tool as independent of their own information, we can design them under that constraint. So we can maybe residualize uh, human signals, for example, and then provide this tool that is independent in it, uh, excuse me, we can provide the tool or the AI signal that's independent of the human's information by design if humans treat it as independent, this is no longer a bias. They're treating it or behaving optimally uh, and sort of correctly understanding the distribution of signals. So I think there's a lot of work that can be done on the design of AI tools. That's maybe a little bit more promising than on the training front. That's not to uh, suggest that we shouldn't train people on how to use these tools, because I think there is a lot that could be learned there. Uh, but one thing I'm sort of actively interested in is how we can better design the tools to maximize the performance of human AI teams uh, rather than solely focusing on, you know, how can we change humans? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is really, a, you know, it's showing that we're kind of maturing in terms of absorbing some of the, this technology. So uh, very, very good point. Well taken. We'll bring that back into our, our group discussion. Okay, next we have Nick. Great. Nick, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, yes. Okay, so Nick's going to talk to us about a very interesting topic, automated annotation with uh, generative LLMs. Um, it's something that's very important um, for researchers, but it has huge implications for um, all these companies that are looking at the volumes of unstructured data uh, that they have and how they potentially might use LLMs to annotate and tag that data. So uh, Nick, can you uh, start your presentation? Yes, thank you, Mary, and thank you, Carol, as well, for having me, and thank you, and Neil and Alex, for those great presentations. Super interesting and and, and really important. So yeah, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit at a very high level about some of my dissertation research on automated annotation, and I'll just make a quick note that this the, the first two chapters of my dissertation and some of what I'll be talking about uh, has been published in. Uh, a couple of computer science outlets. So if you're interested uh, in, in reading about some of this work, uh, uh, these are the links for it. I'm not sure if these will be shared, but uh, I'll put those there in case anyone is interested. Okay, before I talk about automated annotation, I wanna just give a very kind of brief background on manual data annotation. So as, as everyone here is probably aware, machine learning practitioners across industries and applied research settings depend on high quality manually labeled text data for training and validation of supervised language models. And as we also know, these types of models are ubiquitous in industry settings, right? They're being deployed for things like text classification, as Mary mentioned, used to, to structure unstructured data. They're being deployed for automated customer support services and things like information retrieval. And the typical workflow when using this type of technology has, has traditionally been that a human annotator reads a subset of text data, and then a statistical classifier 
generalizes the performance of the human labels. And then we can use this statistical classifier and deploy it in production to either label a much larger text corpus or deploy this for uh, automated customer support services. This is how it traditionally has worked. And so as, as everyone in, in, in this call is thinking about, they're trying to find ways to improve productivity and efficiency using generative AI. And, and, and one type of technology, uh, an application of this tool that I want to try to push is something called automated annotation. And at a high level, we can think of automated annotation as using these generative large language models as a tool to automate this manual annotation procedure. And really, and I'm going to I'm going to draw back to what some of the benefits are, but I'm going to I'm going to push that these tools are effective for automating this task because they're extremely effective at quantifying natural language. They're very easy to use, they're very fast, and they're very cheap. So, the core idea here, as I said, is we're going to take manual annotation and we're going to replace it with something called few shot in context learning. And I'm going to elaborate on, on what that is, what exactly few shot in context learning is. So again, if, if we start with this kind of traditional approach to supervise text classification, what if instead of this first stage here, we just drop that and replaced it with a generative LLM, which labels the first stage of our data for us. And then we either build a statistical classifier on top of these generative labels, or we just have the generative model label the entire text corpus for us. And so I want to elaborate a little bit on what I mean by, by few shot in context learning and how this works just at a very high level. So essentially what I mean is that we're going to take the human annotation instructions and a couple of examples and use them as the prompt input to the generative model and then reframe the task as a text classification problem. So looking to the far left of this diagram here, we're going to take annotation instructions specifying how to classify different text samples into pre-specified categories and concatenate that with strings of text samples in our text corpus and use those together as the input prompt for the generative LLM, which can then be fed to the generative model, which can then classify our text corpus for us, right? And we can imagine different things going in these instructions, right? So this is going back to what Mary said about structuring our data for us, right? There's a variety of tasks that we can specify in here and then plug in our data and carry out the task in an automated fashion for us. So if it's not immediately clear why this is something we might want to think about, I'll spell it out for you. If you've ever worked with human annotation procedures before, you know that it's extremely time consuming. It's extremely expensive, especially if you're hiring domain experts. And, and, and humans make mistakes, right? Humans have, have limited attention span, they get tired, and they might just have an insufficient understanding of the task or the, or the conceptual category that they're annotating. And generative LLMs, on the other hand, are faster than humans, they're cheaper than humans, and they're potentially more accurate than humans. And I, I, I think we should reflect on what this really means, what it would mean to be more accurate than humans, how we would know that. But really the upshot here is that unlike traditional supervised classification, we don't need any training data to get started with annotation procedures when we're using generative LLMs. And so in, in one slide, I'm just gonna give you a, a brief rundown of kind of the first stages of, of my dissertation research. And then I'll allude to how this research has, has carried on. So the first stage of my research was collecting a bunch of data sets that included some type of manual text annotation procedures from, from published articles. And then I developed a, a Python code base to use generative LLMs for automated annotation. And this is available on my GitHub if, if anyone is interested in using it. And what I did was I replicated these manual annotation procedures from these published articles and compared the human annotations to GPT-4 annotations and determined how well do humans and GPT align? And I experimented with various methods to, to reduce the costs associated with this type of technology. Uh, that, that, that was partially the kind of the second half of my dissertation. And really what I wanna drive home is that automated annotation with generative LLMs is an extremely powerful tool. I think it should be implemented into any data science project that involves text data, whether it's structuring your data, text classification, it's extremely powerful. But 
a lot of what my dissertation focuses on is this concern about deploying this technology without carefully validating its performance. So if we deploy this technology without making sure that we're measuring what we think we're measuring or carrying out the task that we think we're carrying out, if we're not checking that in some way, then we risk inaccuracies or pervasive bias. And so this type of argument about making sure we're validating what we're doing carries over to any application of AI technology. We have to make sure we're evaluating it so that we understand whether we're using it properly. Hey, that was, that was great. I, uh, people who are listening will certainly um, take note of a couple of key key items that you stated or key characteristics. I know for me, one of the uh, I, a couple items I, I took away was this, what you said was that you don't need training data, uh, which I think a lot of companies are, are thinking they need that training data. And um, it's, I mean, I thought about it, I know you talked about it, annotation, but it's almost like text categorization, you know, that could be a broader term that maybe more industry application might have. And you could see applications just uh, starting, that, that there'd be a whole application with, like you said, the Python code, that it could be a plugin to take in like particularly all these different reviews. Like how can we structure some of the text of all these reviews and classify them and then use that more um, as a data input to potentially understanding future trends of what our customers might want. So I don't, it, it, uh, is that is that a potential application? What I yeah. just stated? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that that fits pretty closely okay. into the ways that this tool could be used, definitely. All right. And then I, I think you you have the big, it's like would be a big asterisk that um, anytime using any of these tools, uh, you, they can't just go un, un, unchecked um, and a bias and risk are probably some of the most important things that they would have to check in something like this because it become, could become very pervasive um, once you pop, populate uh, using all your reviews. You'd have to do these constant checks to make sure the bias isn't floating one way or the other. Is that true as well? Yeah, it's 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 kind of a buzzkill finding that you know these tools are supposed to kind of reduce the necessity of using humans to create kind of training data, which is still true. But my conclusion is that you still need to use humans to create a validation set. And that's really kind of the conclusion here is that you need to use humans, but maybe it's just a much shorter task to, to, to uh, make sure that you, what you're deploying for the automated technology is working properly. And like you said, that might need to be done at some regular right. cadence. And I wouldn't necessarily say that's a buzzkill, to be honest with you. I think <laughs> that uh, it's, I think it's good. I think people really like hearing that humans still need to be involved in connected yep. in the loop and it just continually yep. repeated that that is necessary. Um, so um, you don't want to run away train. You always want a conductor on the train. You never want to be on a train that potentially there, there's not a conductor that can pull the emergency yep. switch. Yep. Okay, so let's get you, you all, all three of you. Um, I'm going to start out uh, a, a question on, um, I think uh, to, um, I think I'll start a question with Anil. Um, I was so intrigued by the the uh, the research that you provided I was wondering how you think what you saw, what you saw in your initial research, how that might impact how teams are going to be to, um, be formed um, in, in, in at enterprise level. Um, you know, you know, companies that have at least you know, let's, let's say you know, four or five, you know, above five hundred um, employees. You know, in terms of the the team aspect um, in the collaboration, do you see any um, team formation that would be different um, that both uh, you know, senior leaders and HR should look at as they're looking, you know, 18 to 24 months out based on your research? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. I, um, I'm going to answer that in a few ways. One is going to hew closely to what my work is. And uh, the other one is going to just kind of go off a little bit, I think. Um, so we find that there is a, a perceived value that you 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 feel more valued by your peers when you're using generative ai in our study and so that suggests to me that there is at least in this one kind of situation there is no social knockoff on my effort in fact i perceive more because maybe i'm engaging in this task crafting 
And so uh, my overall output is of a, a, a more rich, uh, a rich variety. So I, I suspect that, um, you know, my, my, my close to the best answer is going to be, uh, I suspect that teams are going to have some kind of AI partner. And so it need not be kind of, hey, here's me working with AI and you're working with AI. And, and so we have these like, you know, dyads running around the office everywhere. It, it, it ought to be at some point that um, we are all using it. We acknowledge it. We might have more, um, uh, I hate this word, but we might have more synergy uh, if we had this kind of dedicated team-based uh, 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 partner. Uh, and that way that partner could be a, almost a, start coordinating across our activities a little bit. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll give you, this is my kind of now, I'm going to go off the reservation a little bit. Uh, I'm working with a startup and what they're doing is they're integrating uh, AI, uh, generative AI into the workflow management. And so this is, a, this is a very different model. And the idea here is that we need a task to be accomplished. We kind of don't care who's going to accomplish it. And so let's have a, a, you know, a human at the helm of this, of this process that where an AI is going to make some decisions and the human is going to say that's the right decision or not. And then it's like this workflow where humans are either working with an AI, working by themselves, or overseeing an AI that's accomplishing some tasks in a workflow. So I, I kind of think of it as like a Trello on AI, right? Like, so it's, it's like a, a workflow management, but it has this team aspect to it. I don't see any reason why that can't be a normal model that's adopted at most organizations for most organizational tasks. Wow, I mean that is a lot. That I'm glad you went off the reservation so we can start, you know, thinking of, of like it's great with your picture behind us too. You know, you know, you're thinking into the future. Um, I uh, just to kind of wrap that part up, it, it'll be it's just going to be so critical how a company embraces AI within its culture to make something like that work in terms of, you know, there's this trust, there's, you know, is, you know, big brother watching me, you know, how much are they monitoring? Are they monitoring every single Zoom call? Are they monitoring all my emails? I mean, it's just like, you know, what part of it is, are they allowing me to work and have fulfillment of work versus this, you know, hovering over the productivity? Um, you know, I talked to a lot of young people and, they, they really, they do, they want, to your point, they want to have satisfaction in their work product, but not have to worry so much about this monitoring. So I think there'll be this discussion around monitoring to get full collaboration and fulfillment from these type of, uh, you know, a, a workflow management by AI. So I don't know if you have a comment on that. I, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's a great point. I mean, at least in what, so that that was that was one of the motivators for our research, right? We have this you have this ability to kind of like outsource your thinking. Would you want to do that? Would you want to kind of say, "Hey, I'm not sure what this acronym means," uh, and then it's out there in, a, in a, some code, you know, it's, it's in some uh, log that you keep on some AI tool that might be hosted by your firm. So, at least our research gave us a sense that there's more optimism around. Actually, not more optimism. I should say more different kinds of work actually being done, and more optimism around how I feel in the workplace. And so, I think those concerns are um, just on the surface legit, right? We have to cons we have to consider that. However, at least in this kind of I'm working in my office doing these tasks, we see uh, this positive result. So I think there's some there's some happy medium where we're able to kind of supercharge the organization rather than just thinking of supercharging this one employee. Yeah, great, great, great philosophy, supercharge the organization, and then how the leadership has to embrace that. Um, Alex, as we're, as we're looking at this, you know, really broad, you know, good, good feel picture around, you know, collaboration and AI, um, do you, in this workflow management, do you see any of that applying to you know what you've discovered with um, AI, you know your the radiology and the AI application that you showed with the bias and such. How, how do you see that um, coming into play? And if at all, I mean, you can we can go to a different question if that you don't think that's relative. Or yeah, no, I think um, I've got a few comments. Uh, first, you know when we talk about how humans and AI collaborate today, a lot of our minds jump to things like the other two presentations where we're talking about generative AI. 
So my results can't really speak to that. So just to clarify, uh, our, our paper was studying a, a predictive AI tool that is a version of supervised learning, um, which is very different from the generative AI tools that we see today. So I'm sure there's some work on this. It seems like there's 10 new chat GPT or gen AI papers a day, um, but thinking about what biases humans exhibit when they're collaborating with a generative AI tool, I'm sure that work exists. I'm just not sure of it. Uh, however, in sort of a predictive AI world, um, yeah, I think our results suggest that with the tools that are available today and sort of humans, um, the biases that we just tend to exhibit, uh, we're often going to end up in a solution where we're not going to see a ton of human AI collaboration in sort of an optimal design. We'll see a uh, delegation solution where humans are working alongside AI. And so this, uh, just to, to wrap this back to the presentation, this corresponds to a world where we're going to delegate cases to be either fully automated or read by a human without access to an AI. But the cases where a human uh, input is very valuable are the cases where the AI is pretty uncertain. And because of the biases that humans exhibit, these are cases that uh, humans tend to perform better on when they don't have access to AI. So I've got some ongoing work to think about, you know, how can we design AI to maximize the performance of these two teams? Uh, but I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done um, in this in this setting. Yeah, um, just fascinating. I mean, I just think it's, I, I think we really have benefited by having, I, and I appreciate you providing the um, distinction between pre predictive AI. Is that how you, is that how you clarified it? Predictive AI? Yeah, or I mean, good old fashioned AI before generative AI. Good old, yeah. Right, I mean, it, predictive, I mean, you get predictive analytics, so there's all these different terms. And I, I see it, it, you know, out in the marketplace, some of these things will blur. I mean, as researchers, and uh, you know, people building these tools, they will be distinctly different that you want to tell the marketplace. But in general, it's the lines are starting to blur. And I, uh, you know, as you you're talking about you know, workflow management within radiology that could be probably applicable to other you know diagnostic capabilities in healthcare, and that is going to have implications on how you interact with potentially. AI, whether it's an agent or not, who knows, there might be an agent that is involved with the a, uh, the predictive AI that you are working with, but it will have to interface with an agent in, and then, you know, back to the, to the human and, um, and, and the bias and such. Um, one other question before we go over to Nick is, where do you feel like the, or where do you sense the ethical and regulatory considerations might be starting to flow in with AI and human expertise, you know, especially, let's just take it within radiology, you know, well, that's your wheelhouse, that's your swim lane. So do you have any comments on that or, or any, any predictions going forward, how that will have implications? Yes, yeah, so th this isn't something we studied specifically. So this, you know, won't, all these opinions won't necessarily be informed by our study or the data, uh, but I do have opinions on, on that question. So in medicine in particular, the sort of ethical and legal issues are super important, right? Uh, if you want to deploy an algorithm that's going to fully automate some uh, medical decision, you know that would need to go through uh, the appropriate clearances and and, and so forth. Um, and to my knowledge, I, I don't think that any tools are um, able to be deployed in a medical setting uh, where um, an AI is making sort of the final say. Oftentimes, there's a, a requirement that a human be sort of in the loop, at least within uh, radiology, which is what I know a little bit better. Um, however, this also impacts, these sorts of questions impact how humans use the tools. So uh, in radiology, for example, humans have sort of the final say. They want to be able to explain their decision, right? If um, they do make a mistake and there's maybe some uh, litigation, for example, it's helpful if they can say, this is why I made the decision rather than say, oh, the AI told me this, so I relied on it. So I certainly think that these sorts of ethical and legal issues might impact how humans uh, use these tools because they care about uh, being able to justify the decision that they ultimately came to rather than just sort of pushing the blame onto an AI, which we might think is, would not be super well received um, by a critical audience, if you will. And, and to that point, you know, within these LLMs, there, there is not that explainability, unlike with what you were speaking about with the machine learning 
in um, what is being used around the machine learning and AI, there is explainability and there needs to be explainability because that's not gonna be acceptable for people to go back and say, all right, how was it de decided upon? And they'll be like, oh, well, it's a big black box and you know, it's all, it's just been learning and upon learning. I mean, so this could be at a crossroads for within, sometimes within the metal community when they're using generative AI, if that transparency and explainability is not there. I mean, is that a limitation? I don't know. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, our, in our experiment, the algorithm wasn't very explainable. It was sort of a black box. It wasn't. You could imagine if there was like a saliency map saying, you know, this is how, or this is why the AI came to this conclusion. Uh, perhaps the results would have been slightly different. I think the sort of high level biases would probably still be there. That seems to be a sort of general phenomenon. But certainly, how we provide the the uh, AI predictions would be influential in sort of some of the effects that we see. But I know um, Nick has worked a lot with with LLMs, and I think uh, if I recall, he has some work on explainability with LLMs. Um, so I, I would defer to my my other panelists for their expertise. Okay, that was my next question. So thank you for, uh, so Nick, what well, based on that question, what 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 do you think? So, in terms of the ability, go ahead. I, I mean, it's tough, right? So there's, I mean, there LLMs are a black box, a hundred percent, and we don't know why they are making decisions. And there's certain there's papers that are trying to figure out, you know, which layers of the neural network process, which types of, you know, questions, um, and so we have this issue of not understanding how an LLM comes to a conclusion. But what we can figure out is whether or not it aligns with the human at the output. And that is something where I think we need to focus more of our attention is trying to figure out, okay, when does this align with humans? When does it not align with humans? And then we can try to figure out, okay, why is this not aligning with humans, right? So there's still kind of this interpretability question of why it's coming to a certain conclusion. And there's there's research coming out trying to, trying to find ways to make these tools more explainable, right? Like asking an LLM, why did you make this decision? Uh, I think we should be a little bit skeptical of those approaches uh, if, if they're if they're adding any value. Um, but yeah, what I would say is pushing us towards uh, keeping our automated tasks grounded in human judgment in some way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, as you were speaking, uh, I mean, two thoughts came to mind and I don't know. You should you should hear us all talk. I mean, we're all saying it. We don't know how these work. I mean, so is that on? I mean, I don't know. It might we. It might be on on researchers and you know other individuals you know that are talking about responsible AI, AI to say you know what we need to understand this. I mean, it's it's like you hit the gold mine and you know there's a, it's a gold rush and a gold vein but you know is, is are we going to tear apart, apart the mountain and there's going to be some other drastic things that are happening i don't know it's just it's interesting to know how everyone is accepting that you can't explain it however i think with your particular um point that you made which is you want to know if it aligns with the human output that's why there always has to be humans in the loop and then you know if it doesn't align go and find out why it doesn't align. What is causing that? So it's like, yeah. there's a leak. You got to find out where the water is coming from. And it can come from any part in your house or building or whatever, but you got to go find it. You might not know exactly where it is. Yeah. So um, we, we just have to, I think, probably emphasize that um, as we continue, we're getting, you know, as they say, getting over your skis, um, you still have to um, look for the bias, the explainability, um, and, and the alignment with the, the human judgment. Okay, well, we just have a few more minutes left. And I would just wanted to know if you all had any particular questions that you wanted to bring up to one another on this topic of AI and, and, and human collaboration, or if there's any final statements that you would like to make about what you see or what you're most looking forward to, I would say in the next 18 months, um, like looking forward, what would you like to see happening in two places. One, in, in industry, in enterprises, how possibly companies will be changing or adopting. And then secondly, within the research community. So who would like to take that first? 
I can offer. I'm always some happy comments. to start. No, oh, oh, no, Nick, go ahead. Okay. All right. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so, I think that there's a lot of work to be done in general on evaluation of these tools. So, just to make a quick dif differentiate here. Explanation is, is one issue of, of how these tools are working and evaluation is a related but different task of trying to figure out where does this model, where does this tool work better than other types of applications, right? And so when a new model comes out, we do some tests on it to try to determine if this model is working better than other models. And I think that the current state of these tests are, it, it's not great. I, I sat in a, a, a panel a couple of weeks ago where one uh, machine learning researcher said that the current state of evaluation for AI tools is going off of what the vibes are. So I think we need to really think carefully about what it means to evaluate these tools. Is an LLM's performance on the bar exam really indicative of how it's legal reasoning, legal reasoning capabilities, for example, or is it demonstrating something else like information retrieval, right? We need to start asking these questions more seriously if we're gonna be deploying these in a variety of use cases. I think that that's something, making evaluation more of a science and, and putting more efforts into how we evaluate these tools is, is gonna be really, really important forward. So I'm gonna piggyback on what you said, Nick, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of provide some other thoughts. So I, I think the one thing we have to, acknowledge, and I, I'm not ascribing intelligence uh, to these tools yet, but we're benchmarking it against tasks that we consider to be intelligent for humans. And it's not clear that these tools are going to subscribe to the notion of human intelligence. But I, I think your point is extremely valid and, and very, very, very good. Um, so from, from my point of view, I think that um, we have this kind of prevailing advice that we give uh, to firms right now. And it's kind of like, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, run a bunch of experiments, see what's working, uh, have everyone kind of play around with it and surface these ideas and create communications and and kind of experiment with the tools so you don't get left behind. I think that's the prevailing advice given to firms. Now, I'm a, I'm a strategy professor, uh, so I would like to see the shift in the next 18 months uh, going from kind of um, letting a thousand flowers bloom in these kind of uh, bottoms up experiments to some notion of uh, strategy making around generative AI, uh, whether it's for internal processes, whether it's in service uh, of uh, the products and services that are being offered, whether it's some uh, complement that's being offered to these products and services, I would like to see a broader strategy making around generative AI for, for any firm, not just kind of generative AI firms. I'm talking about for every firm, uh, basically. Um, and then on the research side, I think kind of there's an analog here where I, I don't remember Nick or, or Alex who said it, but there is a gold rush in research right now around generative AI. And so that means that there's a competition, right? And so we're, we're, we're competing in the market for ideas. What I would like to see is research that is much more grounded, much more long-term oriented and kind of think about let's what are, what are the interventions that we want to see operate for months rather than days, like my study, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm very much a, a part of this uh, a, a statement that I'm making, but we wanna have a, a much broader understanding of what the rich variation and use cases and use types and uh, um, task types are. And, and we wanna start being able to have some insight on much more granular types of interactions that take place over a longer term. I, I totally agree with both uh, what Nick and Anil just said. I, I would add a little bit to what Nick said in terms of evaluation. Um, I think it's also important to take into account how humans will use these tools in terms of evaluation. So, you know, it's expensive to evaluate uh, and run these experiments where we're actually giving these tools to, to humans. However, I think it's important that we do that because it's not necessarily that the best tool on some metric, whatever it is, maybe it's a bar exam, maybe it's something else, uh, but the best tool at, at taking this exam might not be the best tool for humans to use sort of in collaboration for their for their work. So I think that's particularly relevant uh, for this session on, on worker uh, AI collaboration. Well, I just want to thank all three of our guests, Anil, Alex, and Nick, um, for everything that you have provided for us today. Um, and the three key things that I, I took away from your last comments are 
um, maybe emphasizing a bit more on evaluation versus explanation, um, possibly grounding some of the research a bit more. Um, this might help influence how uh, industry is also absorbing it. Everyone is reacting to these top vendors that are putting the tools out there and so possibly change the course of the or the flow of the game uh, on the, from the industry and researchers and policy side um, to demand possibly a bit more of this you know grounded research that they could be that these uh, vendors could be involved in. And then um, I, you said it so well a, a few times, Alex, and that is looking at and it's plays back to that grounded research and evaluation, evaluating how humans are using the tools in decision making. So really, and that's where industry and enterprise can work with researchers to study that and maybe push back to the open AIs and the, and the <clears throat> Googles and Microsofts to have them work on where it's being placed in decision-making and potentially to your point, Neil, the strategy, like what is the priority that you would like to see these tools instead of just a splattering, you know, every couple of months. But I think it was great. This it was such a an, an, um, very vibrant conversation around AI and human collaboration. Uh, thank you so much to all of you. And I want to thank all of those um, people who are listening. Please continue to um, to look at all of our other episodes on AI Horizons. My name is Mary Perk, the Executive Director at Wharton, and um, have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Bye.